Okay, so now I would like to um, introduce our MC for the afternoon. Cami Osman is the founder of The Narrative Project, a nine month program that gives writers everything they need to get their book done. Author of Second Wind, One Woman's Midlife Quest to Run Seven Marathons on Seven Continents, and most recently, this one right here, 26.2, helping you keep pace with marathon life, which she co-wrote with um, local, another Bellinghamster, uh, Carol Frazee. Um, she's also an editor of many anthologies, and Cami believes in the power of words to create our identities. Cami and the Narrative Project coaches have dual passions, supporting writers as they both get their books done and supporting writers as they create new identities and transform into better versions of themselves. She's here to lead the presentation of this book right here, True Stories, Volume 4. So please welcome Cami Osman. Thank you so much, Claire. That was so, so appreciate it. Um, I'm happy to be here. I'm deliriously excited and um, want to just say a few words before I start to invite our, our readers tonight want to welcome everybody who's joined us and thank you for coming tonight. We have a huge group and I, I was so excited to see that we crested 100. I was saying to the writers, come on, let's get 100 people in the room. So we've, we've done that and we're really, really happy that you're all here. I just want to say a couple of words about the narrative project. The narrative project is five years old. We celebrated five years in October. And what started out as a little program designed to help writers get their books done has grown into a community of committed individuals who support one another through the entire book journey from idea to publication. We are committed to each other's writing and to each other's publication and having each other's backs when it gets hard. We've graduated 82 writers and celebrated the publication of many members books. Uh, we've added eight wonderful coaches and this is our fourth anthology. So I'm so proud, I'm beaming, I'm excited for all of these authors, their first time, some of them, to see their names in, in print. So this anthology, True Stories, showcases the writing of the Narrative Project cohort from the previous year. And we've taken to given our cohorts nicknames, mostly because it got confusing when we had too many Facebook groups. So the 2020 group was dubbed the fireworks. They are definitely sparkly. Our goal for the fireworks group was to have them take a piece of writing that they'd produced during the nine months that they were with us. Cami, I'm yeah. sorry. I act that was that was my the slip of the mouse. I apologize. I didn't mean slip to be a good mouse. Yes, <laughs> I'm sorry. Please proceed. <laughs> Little slip of the mouse. So our goal for the fireworks was to have them take a piece of writing that they'd produced during their nine months with us and um, and then craft that into a standalone piece. So I want to offer huge congratulations to everybody from the fireworks cohort and also to some of our next chapter authors who contributed. They're in our revisions program and our coaches who are always welcome to publish with us. Uh, the, the work here represents a lot of hard work to get these pieces into the, into, the, um, into the form that they're in right now. We like to say that every great piece of writing does not represent good writing. Actually, it represents good revisions because the first time through is usually kind of sketchy, but these works have been really crafted. So most of them are memoir, want to make that point, but we, have, we do have a few fictional pieces sprinkled throughout, and I will indicate when they're fiction. That's important because if the fiction is written from first person, we don't want you thinking it's about that author's family when it's actually not. So I will make sure to say that uh, for the fictional pieces. And then just before we get to the readings, I want to offer a shout out to some of the hardest working people uh, as related to this volume. A huge thanks to Dana Ty Rally, who is who who functioned as our uh, author wrangler and did a lot of the original edits and um, worked with our authors to get them get their revisions done as well as Nancy Canyon and Rebecca Mabangla Mayar, who also helped in the revision 
journey here to get these pieces to the quality that they're at tireless commitment to quality and to advocacy for our authors. And then I also want to give um, a deep bow actually to Lisa Daly of Silent Sidekick and Sidekick Press, who is not only a contributor to this volume, but also our publisher. Her personal and professional support for me um, and for all of the crazy things that I do is it's unprecedented in my life. I love her to pieces and we really couldn't do anything that we're doing without her. So Lisa, thank you. So without further delay, we're gonna start our readings. Each reader has taken a snippet out of their published piece and once again, crafted that into a tiny arc to give you a taste of their outstanding voices and the content of their material. So they're each going to read a little bit from what they've, what they've written and to hear the rest of the story, you will have to buy the book. So without further ado, we'll start with our first author, Heidi Fischbach. Heidi has spent decades crushed out on poets and authors secretly longing to do what they do. She's also spent decades shining the light of awareness on her own evangelical missionary kid childhood in Chile teenage emotional instability at boarding school in Ecuador, and the ensuing devastation of her young adulthood in the States. What smells, what wanting smells like is an excerpt of her upcoming memoir, whose working title is Homesick. Heidi? I follow the no dating rule, like all the rules before. Rules like no dancing, no bikinis, no swearing. Even words like gosh or gee, stand-ins for saying God or Jesus, are considered taking the Lord's name in vain, which could send a person straight to hell, no matter how good or sorry they are. My brother and I are in Quito, Ecuador, in a boarding school for children of missionaries, while my parents and little brother and sister remain 3,500 miles away in southern Chile, the place I call home. But distance only makes me more obedient, as if the following of rules could ensure our bond. The closest I come to dating is having crushes, but the objects of my crushing are either boys who aren't interested in me or an adult teacher completely out of the realm of possibility. Mr. Stevens. Mr. Stevens is my science teacher, and I like how he smells. Some of my friends are in his Christian service outreach group, but not me. Maybe I'm not cool enough, or maybe he's looking for actual teenagers, and my chest still looks like I'm 10, even though I'm 13. One day during spiritual emphasis week, which is like a tent campaign only in the school chapel instead of in a tent, I find a way to talk to Mr. Stevens outside of class. I've been paying attention as best I can, but there's been competition for my interest sitting one row and several seats over from me. And while everyone has been singing and while the preacher has been praying, I've been thinking about Mr. Stevens who smells so good, something like forest moss with a touch of vanilla. On the last night I linger after the meeting, I've been trying to think of something I could stay after and talk to him about, probably something to do with my spiritual life. When the CSO kids who've been standing around him talking and laughing so easily leave and he looks up and sees me off to the side, I feel my cheeks redden. When he smiles, I take a breath and walk over. He listens kindly and talks to me for a few minutes. And when he notices it's getting late and the chapel is, chapel is almost empty, he offers to walk me back to the dorm. Later, I won't be able to remember the conversation on that five minute walk, but does it even matter? He's walking with me, he in his jeans and blue windbreaker, he with those very kind eyes behind those very thick glasses. Once we're at the double door entrance to the dorm, he says he should probably get going, adding, can I give you a hug? My heart stops, a hug from Mr. Stevens, who smells so good. Sure, I say, trying to sound like it's no big deal. He puts his arms around me and I turn my head to the side so my cheek rests on his chest. He's big and he's strong and I'd be okay with the world ending right here and now with me in his arms. A wire has been tripped inside me. It's tingly and primed with longing. I could never have admitted to my crush at the time, but there's no fooling about it in hindsight. I adored him. I wanted to be near him and his attention meant the world to me. That he was married and out of my age range didn't matter one bit. Actually, all the better. Completely safe to have secret feelings for. 
without having to admit to something so laughably impossible. At the end of that year, Mr. Stevens asks if I'd like to join his CSO group the following year. Sure, I say, trying to sound like it's no biggie. Thank you. Mm, thank you, Heidi. Twinkle fingers, that's how we applaud in the narrative project, making sure people know we're with you. Nice work. Our next reader is Kit Flynn. Kit Flynn's traveling childhood translated to 16 different bedrooms in her first 20 years and an uncontrollable craving for attachment. The often nonlinear journey through grief, trauma, and codependency recovery is the topic of her forthcoming memoir, Ordinary Mary. Kit is now firmly rooted in Ottawa. Tonight, she reads from her piece, No Fixed Address, an excerpt from that memoir. Kit. Many years ago, my father's trusted and beloved mentor, his maiden aunt Mary, shared an intimate moment of awe with him while she pressed her hands on my mother's belly and felt me somersault inside. This two hour trip by the newlyweds to visit aunt, uh, my, my father's aunt Mary was critical. Usually oozing with confidence, he sought counsel and reassurance from the one person he trusted the most. Freddie, my future father and superhero, was ambitious and also knew without a doubt at age 26 that he drank too much. Now he was a new husband, soon to become a lawyer, but a father too. Could he handle all this? He needed to hear Mary say that he could. 32 years <clears throat> after this visit, Mary, now long deceased, I seek therapy for the first of many times in my life, this time to understand the cause of intense distress I'm feeling over my father's unexpected death from a heart attack. I call myself Kit Flynn from No Fixed Address. I quit to my therapist at our first meeting as I hugged a throw pillow to my chest. I laughed automatically, which usually got someone else laughing along with me as we envisioned some old wanted dead or alive poster outside a rickety jailhouse. I told her how my dad was obsessed with becoming a millionaire, moving us every 18 months, and about his progressive and violent drinking problem. We were nomads and survivors, I said, my voice now strong and proud, camouflaging something I didn't yet understand. My entire sense of belonging, I said, wasn't tied to a house, a city, a province, or even to Canada. It was portable and tied directly to my nuclear family, especially to my father. The therapist jotted a note. In thinking back, I realized she must have begun to put together the impact on me of my father's death against the backdrop of the family disease of alcoholism, a troubled childhood, codependency, and now, a zero sense of belonging. My dad's death was the first of what turned out to be an endless list of those losses of losses and traumas to come. Through a series of coincidences occurring in my late 40s and at my lowest point, I was reminded of my dad's mentor, whom I had never met, my extraordinary great aunt Mary. My quest to research Mary would reveal the legacy of a woman I came to know and respect just as my father had, whose advice and pep talks I began to easily imagine. Through her poetry, her plays, and from talking to those who knew her, Mary, or ordinary Mary as she would have thought of herself, uh, be became a spiritual and moral mentor, my home base. I shook my family tree and out dropped a loving coach in a great aunt I had never met. She helped to bring me home in many ways, home to my true self and home to previously denied truths of faith. She provided me with a newfound sense of belonging to the Ottawa Valley and now shines as my North Star. Thank you. Nice work, Kit. Thank you so much. Great. Our next reader, Martha Oliver Smith, we call her Patty, is a retired college and secondary school literature and writing teacher and the author of a memoir, Martha's Mandala. 
She lives in Albany, Vermont, where she is working on her second memoir, Marnie's Voices, about her mother, an author and eccentric parent. Tonight, she reads from her piece, Directions Home, Points West. Patty? Ashland, Oregon, 1972. What am I doing here? I keep asking myself. I never wanted to sell all our possessions and move across the country with three small children. Never asked to live in this dry, dusty place, hotter than hell with no job prospects and no family. But this is my way. I always drift in the wake of someone else's desires. This time, instead of my mother's whims, it's my husband Jim's will and our friends, Maggie and Dan, who insist it will all be wonderful. Ashland is the happening place to be. There are nine of us in Maggie and Dan's one bedroom cottage, four adults and five children between the ages of one and six. Jim and I sleep outside in a tent while our children sleep on mats in the living room. Maggie and I share cooking and childcare while Dan works at a bicycle shop and Jim explores the town, supposedly looking for work. Recently, I have become aware there is some tension just under the surface between Maggie and Jim and Dan and Maggie. I feel it, but I don't wanna think about it. I'm good at avoiding certain realities by imagining ways around them. I sometimes fantasize about a tragic demise for Jim. I would be a grieving widow, but I would get over it. I like the idea of Jim, but Jim himself is another matter. These thoughts intrude when I'm coping with the constant needs of children and chores. I don't want to think about why I'm really in this alien place, 3,000 miles from home. One evening after dinner, Maggie suggests Jim and I take a walk so we can have a little time to ourselves. Jim eagerly agrees. We head to Cook's Reception Tavern on Ashland's Main Street. Cook's is like a long train car with baby shit yellow walls, wooden tables and metal folding chairs that hug one wall opposite the bar. No pretensions or potted ferns here. The place is filled with the mixed crowd that claims it is turf, Shakespeare theater actors, loggers, bikers, tourists and students from the local college. We claim two bar stools and I catch a glimpse of myself and Jim in the back bar, framed by the gleaming rows of liquor bottles, jars of pickled eggs and pig's feet, a happy hippie couple. Noise and cigarette smoke clog the air. A belly dancer roams through the crowd, bumping a hip here and there, jingling her, her golden discs. She's all ringlets and bells and waves of heat and patchouli oil steaming from her belly. She winks at Jim. He is talking. The noise is so loud, I'm not sure if I'm hearing him right. Jim has a way of clearing his throat when he's nervous that I've always found annoying. He's doing it a lot right now. I focus on him through the haze, trying to take in what he's saying. Something about Maggie. He looks serious. Whatever it is, it's hard for him to say. What's that again? Maggie and I are more throat clearing. We think we can work this out with you and Dan. He looks earnest as if he's memorized his part in a school play. I have to tell you this. I've been fucking other women for years. I can't help it. I'm sorry. We can, we can do this. Be married and be with other people. Maybe you and Dan, you know. I stare at my husband. I'm on fire. What am I doing here? I push my way through the crowd, out of the bar, and start running. Thank you. Nice work, Patty. And if they want to find out where you went, they'll buy the book, read the rest of the story. Good cliffhanger. Great. Next, we have Kathy Wagner. Kathy Wagner is a Canadian addictions support advocate who writes about family, grief, hope, addiction, recovery, and finding joy. She's honed her writing skills through the Narrative Project and the Banff Writers Retreat and has had multiple pieces published in the Globe and Mail. Tonight, Kathy reads from her forthcoming memoir. This piece is called Surrender. Thanks, Cami. This scene takes place after finally getting my son, Tristan, to agree to go to an addictions treatment center, and we're just arriving. Tristan finished his last smoke, tossed the butt, and we crossed the road to the unobtrusive low-rise apartment building, older but well-kept. He carried his duffel bag with a few clothes and toiletries he'd haphazardly thrown in. Four or five guys sat out front. They each greeted, greeted us with a polite, hi, or, how's it going, and plenty of eye contact. One tall, good-looking guy in his late 20s stood up, smiled at Tristan, and said, hi, are you a new guy? 
Yeah, I guess, Tristan mumbled, eyes down. Welcome, I'm Vaughn. He shook Tristan's hand. You're going to love it here. They're going to fatten you up. You're skinny, bro. Come on, I'll find someone to do your intake. Vaughn held the door and got us seated. In the few minutes we waited, half a dozen men of all ages walked past. Every one of them welcomed Tristan. Many gave me words of encouragement, too. They told me he was in a good place, that I could stop worrying and sleep again. They called me mom. I smiled at them, blinking back tears at the simple feeling of being understood, of being in a place where young men smiled. One guy asked if I wanted coffee, and when I told him I drank tea, seemed near giddy that he could get that too. He returned a minute or two later, apologizing for taking so long. I didn't know what you liked, so I brought one of each option. He grinned, pulling an assortment of crumpled tea bags from his jean pockets, front and back. I wasn't thrilled about the tea bags in his pockets, but he seemed so earnest that I couldn't say no. I chose mint medley. As Tristan did his intake, one of the caseworkers showed me around. The center was spread ac across two small apartment buildings and one large heritage home on a typical suburban street. Nothing fancy, but clean, comfortable, homey. There was a huge bowl of apples, oranges, and bananas in the living room, which felt good. Nobody was starving here. Some guys were playing chess, another strummed a guitar, a few wrote in notebooks, and a bunch sat around in the sunshine talking. There was an abundance of tattoos, but everybody looked healthy and happy, just normal guys. I soaked it in, knowing this would be Tristan's home for the next three months at least. These were going to be his people. I began to hope. I wanted this so badly for Tristan. Seeing the guys, hearing their laughter made it seem possible. Back on the front steps, I hugged Tristan goodbye, breathed him in, and told him I loved him. His arms hung at his side as I wrapped mine around him. He was uncomfortable in my hug, uncomfortable in his body. One of the guys walked by just then, chuckled and said, go on, give your mom a hug. She deserves it, man. Tristan gave me a quick hug, all edges and nerves. Love you, mom, he said, and went inside. Driving home alone, I was overwhelmed by relief. I was still anxious. What if he didn't stay? And scared, he's not going to stay. But above all that was relief. I'd done my part. He was, he was safe. I could breathe now, deeply in and out. I had so much space around me and in me. Where did all that space come from? What was I going to do with it? Thank you. Nice, Kathy. Thank you so much. Next, we have Jill Vanneman, who says, you're never too old to write. And Jill should know. She's been writing since she learned how to hold a pencil. Currently, she resides in Seattle with her cat, Pablo, tuxedo cat, Pablo, whom she considers her muse. I've seen Pablo on screen. She reads from her piece in the anthology entitled Lost. Jill. Thank you. After two days of bushwhacking, my hands were raw and my army pants partially torn from st torn sticker bushes and rock scrambling. I stood at one side of the Merced River and pondered how to cross with a full backpack without taking my boots off. I was trying to figure out where the water was shallowest so I wouldn't have to get wet because although now it was a sunny and warm spring day, I didn't know what the weather would be like through the evening. I wanted to avoid wet clothes and hypothermia. I paced back and forth along the river, trying to gauge how far apart and how big the rocks were to see if I could jump across using the rocks as stepping stones. Okay, I decided after many agonizing minutes, this is where I'll cross. The rocks were further apart than I wanted them to be. That middle rock particularly gave me pause. I would have to nail it just right with a full backpack somewhere inside with the confidence that only a 22 year old can have. I knew I was going to make it. The rock was slick with water and I felt myself sliding when the back of my head hit that stupid middle rock hard. I lay there for a moment, registering what had just happened. And then I felt the pain and then the fear hit. 
oh God, this is it, it's over. In my mind, I said goodbye to my family. My brother would be upset with me for being so cavalier about the rules of surviving in the wilderness. What will they think when they find my body? I really didn't know what to expect as my whole body landed in that river face up. But I quickly realized I was alive and being carried away by the current, not being carried away by the current. I felt the back of my head where a large knot was rising. And then I got up from the river, my backpack, still intact, and my socks and boots, thoroughly wet, grateful that I was very much alive, though completely soaked. I hauled myself out and thought, oh God, Jill, how melodramatic. And also, now what? My I can do this all by myself confidence was decimated, and I was also still lost. I spied a bluff ahead and determined that I should hike up the bluff, take everything off and lay in the sun for a while to dry my clothes and myself. What I didn't know as I lay there drying off was that the Madeira County Sheriff's had been grilling my hiking companions with questions about my sanity and how experienced a hiker I was. And now I too was wondering how or if I would get out. Thank you. Hmm, I think we must know that you got out, but I can't wait to find out how. (laughs) Thank you, Jill. Our next reader is Dana Tyrally. Dana is thrilled to have quit her day job to work entirely with writers. They're cheerleaders, they're whip crackers, and they're creations. A coach for the Narrative Project and an editor for this very volume, the Narrative Project Volume 4. She has appeared in True Stories Volume 2 as well. She's written award-winning articles for newspapers and been published in numerous magazines. Lessons in Reverse is her memoir in progress. She reads from her piece tonight in the anthology called He and She. Dana? Where am I? <laughs> there you are. Here I am. Oh, I'm loving these readings so far. It's such a thrill to be here. When I think of mom and dad's marriage, I think of two distant streams flowing into the same river by chance. The river they join is a murky one. Dad slowed by its sediments, mom trying to skirt the debris. Through the birth of three children, my father's deceptions drag him further and further toward bottom while mom, despite the turbulence, remains void, a ripple riding its surface. Their lives first intersect at a party of unsupervised teens in a mansion in one of Vancouver's oldest neighborhoods. The month is September, still warm enough for open windows and laughter spilling onto the lawn in staccato bursts. The mansion is where mom first lays eyes on him, one half of our future DNA. To be fair, mom hears dad before she actually sees him. As she tiptoes upstairs to the front door, sidestepping fallen leaves, the sound of someone retching escapes through a window. The perpetrator is dad, drinking and dozing against the powder room toilet bowl. Mom walks in, and just then, dad staggers out. It's her first glimpse of his struggle to accept the earth under his feet. They meet again a week later at a booth with friends at the Commodore ballroom. Dad's chatting up mom to get to her friend Jackie, a girl who's already taken. One, two, three o'clock, four o'clock, rock, starts up, and Dad asks Mom to dance. What he isn't expecting as he leads Mom onto the floor is her stellar sense of rhythm, her rocking rock step, the way she spins on command, the way she falls in line with such ease and grace he forgets about Jackie, while the other jivers usher Mom and Dad into the spotlight. Space to shimmy, space to kick their legs like donkeys up to the sky. Seconds later, dad holds up a hand and mom stops. He makes a beeline to go throw up in the men's jaw. Mom's sitting in the booth, checking her watch when he comes back. Mind if I sit, he asks. Mom does mind. She's not the sitting around kind. 
She's been tapping her heels and craning her neck at a big dance floor pulsing with life. Yet she turns toward dad's bloodshot eyes and something changes her mind. Maybe the way he holds his loneliness like a cloak. Maybe that's what tugs at her insides. She's seen her father and brother wear that look, that collapse, the trembling mouth of a man morphing back into a boy. Dad leans in. I don't need a drink if I get to talk to you. Taking dad at his word is mom's first mistake. Dad believing his own lies is his. But they are teenagers after all. Walking back after through the parking lot, her head tilting toward his just so, the moon shines a path all the way to dad's car. Tonight, some river somewhere has begun to rise frothy and full. They haven't gotten to where they're headed just yet and a river has already begun to roar. That's it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Deanna. Thank you so much. So beautiful. Thank you. Next we have Victoria Peters. We call her Tori. Tori loves to travel and write about her travels. Two highlights in the past few years include walking over 500 miles solo on the Camino de Santiago and trekking through the Peruvian Andes. Several of her travel articles have appeared in her local online newspaper and two short memoir pieces are published in the Narrative Project anthologies. Remembering You is the title of her first memoir and tonight she reads an excerpt called Priscilla. Tori? Thank you. I'm waiting. To... <laughs> okay. The calls of the cicadas. Am I on? Yeah. Okay. You're on. Okay. The calls of the cicadas from the hibiscus plants filled the air as I stepped out the front door onto, onto the tiled porch of our house in Bamako, Mali to greet my husband, Ron. The mango, cashew, and citrus trees provided welcome shade from the relentless heat. He climbed the three steps to the porch, followed by our four children. Between his hands, he carried a brown cardboard box and gently placed it on the white wrought iron patio table. Matt, 10, Nick, 9, and Maria, 8, staked out spots around it while two and a half year old Sarah climbed up on one of the chairs to get a better view. As I joined them, I noticed tiny short haired human like fingers reaching through the slit between the cardboard flaps. I gasped in surprise. The big kid's eyes lit up with an understanding. Sarah turned to me to be held. I picked her up and her right arm curled around the back of my neck. We watched Ron carefully open the overlapping, overlapping flaps. A dark golden haired head with fleshy ears and face popped out. Bushy black eyebrows raised up and two dark eyes looked at the six faces peering back at it. Oh, a monkey, crooned the kids. I said nothing. Ron smiled as he placed his strong and calming hands around the juvenile body and lifted it out of the box. Two white haired bony arms wrapped around his neck, a baby clinging to his father. A chorus of questions tumbled out of the kids. Are we going to keep it? Can we hold it? Is it a boy? Is it a girl? A girl, he said. Sarah wiggled out of my arms and back onto the chair. Conflicting feelings played havoc with my sense of logic. My curiosity of the small primate coming into our lives mixed with my concern over its intrusion into our already busy family. I had to admit the monkey's appeal, but it was not a cat or a goat or a goose or a West African tortoise, all already wandering around our yard. I would ask Ron later the hard questions about raising her in our family. Better let her get used to us first, he said. What kind of monkey? I asked. A patus. Can she come into the house? The kids asked. Occasionally, we'd seen wild baboons wandering the roads and hanging out in the large rock outcroppings when we drove out into the bush. We kept our distance for they were wild and could even kill when provoked or angry. 
The monkeys I was most familiar with were the ones I'd seen in zoos and pet stores at home. The one cage we had in the house, our pet guinea pig already inhabited, but we still had the carrier which Giles, our cat, had traveled in from the States two years earlier. She could sleep in the cat carrier tonight, I volunteered. One of the kids said, let's call her Priscilla. Thank you. Nice. <laughs> I love the story of Priscilla. Thank you, Tori. You're welcome. Great. Our next reader is Roger Leishman. Originally from Vancouver, Roger now lives across the border in Bellingham, Washington with his three children and two Aussie doodles. He's a graduate of Brigham Young University and Yale Law School. After a distinguished legal career in private practice, public service and LGBT rights litigation, he was diagnosed with PTSD. He now focuses his writing and advocacy on mental illness. Tonight, his piece is entitled, For Good. Roger. Thank you, Cammie. Dogs were never part of my life growing up. Then when I became a fabulous gay adult, I never saw the attraction of any kind of pet. As I jokingly told folks, if I wanted that much responsibility, I might as well have kids. My life changed in my 40s when my ex and I adopted one, two, then three kids. Although we separated when the kids were still young, my ex and I continued to amicably co-parent. In contrast with my pet-free upbringing, my ex's family always had dogs when he was growing up. After we separated, he acquired a more compatible husband and eventually a house with a fenced backyard. Five years ago, the kids got a puppy they named Bear. Apparently dogs are like children in Doritos. As long as you're at it, you might as well have one more. So Buster arrived a year later. Biologically, Bear and Buster are some kind of cousins, but in a house full of adopted kids, it's reasonable for everyone to refer to the dogs as brothers. After many years of alternating kid weeks, everything changed again a couple of years later when my ex and his new husband decided to get a divorce. My ex quickly moved home to the Midwest. In the shuffle, I ended up with three kids full time, plus two dogs. Buster is my sensitive elder daughter's comfort animal and Bear became my first and last dog. Bear and Buster are purebred Aussie doodles, the trendy cross between an Australian shepherd and a poodle. Buster is dumb and lazy, but happy. His highest and best use is to lounge on the couch and comfort my lazy children. In contrast, Bear is smart and athletic and charming with a striking pied beauty. He has one blue eye and one brown eye. Bear's variegated shades of curly cream and brown fur blend together like a shaggy Tina Turner wig from her Mad Max era. Bear is more attractive than anyone I've ever dated, way out of my league. Now, as I walk past strangers on the waterfront trail, I often hear audible sighs of, oh, he's so cute. Sadly, it's never about me. Nevertheless, the best thing about going on long walks with Bear every day is that everyone we encounter is smiling. Yes, I know they're not smiling at me, but they're smiling at us and at everyone else for a little while. Surely that makes the world a slightly better place. On our last walk along the boardwalk, Bear asked if I plan on getting a new dog after he's gone. I said no. I told Bear I would keep taking a take, keep taking care of poor Buster if my daughter turns out to be a flake. But when it comes to pets, I'll stick with a fabulous gay uncle role from now on. Still, regardless of what happens in the future, I know that having a dog, having Bear in my life has changed me for good. The other day, my younger daughter saw me reading a library book with the title, Dog's Best Friend, the story of an unbreakable bond. Eleanor laughed and said, Two years ago, Papa, you wouldn't even let Bear come over to visit. Now the two of you are besties. Yep. Thank you. That's great, Roger. Well, I'm smiling at you. That much is for sure. And so Bear. is everybody here. <laughs> and Bear is right there, I'm sure. Great. Thank you. Our next reader is Kimberly Brown, writing under her pen name, Emma Kim. Want to jump in there? Kimberly yes. immigrated to the United States from Taiwan with her Asian mother and military father during the Vietnam War in the 60s. 
It wasn't until she'd attended college after her parents' divorce and after years of being called half-breed that she was able to see how others' perceptions shaped her identity. She is now committed to expanding awareness for children born of a multiracial, multicultural, and multilingual union. Her excerpt tonight is from her piece called Family Values. Kimberly? Thank you, Tammy. What's up, bro? I picked up my phone, upbeat, ready for my morning dose of sibling entertainment. My brother Daniel usually called me on his way to work in sunny San Diego. Hello? Did he butt down me? Hello? It's Riley, he said. She's, and then he trailed off. Daniel, everything okay? She's, she's just so small. I'm so sorry. And then he began to cry. Daniel, what are you crying about? What's wrong with Riley? I became immediately stern and demanding. It's what I do when I'm worried. It's her birthday today, he muttered between his tears. She's 11. She's so small. I'm so sorry, Emma. And with that, Daniel was lost again in his tears. I was just 11 years old when my mother dropped us off at our paternal grandmother's house. Our dad was out of town on a business trip. I caught my mother packing a suitcase. Something felt off. She never went anywhere and she certainly never left us with our grandmother. My grandmother called my Asian mother a war bride and my mother said my grandmother lived like a pig. I heard my mother say she'd only be gone for the weekend. My grandmother acted put out, rolled her eyes, huffed and stared back at the television, whatever. It's not like I might've had some plans. Just go on, she grumbled. And she waved the back of her hand the same way one would shoo a fly. Take care of your brother, she whispered. Thank you, mom, thank you, she said, as she bowed repeatedly in the traditional Asian manner, expressing her gratitude. And she stepped backwards out the front door. The door shut with a heavy thud, a sound that marked a permanent change in our lives. Sitting on my knees on my grandmother's plastic covered couch, I looked out the front big picture window across the lawn and the broken down fence. My mother got in the car and drove away. She never looked back. The weekend came and went, as did the week. When mom, when's mom coming back? Daniel asked. There was no point in sugarcoating it. It would only make things worse. She's not coming back, Daniel. Don't worry about her. I'll take care of you. Today, on his own daughter's 11th birthday, my brother has a new awareness of our past, looking at Riley and realizing just how young 11 actually is. Too young to be suddenly responsible for our whole family. I'm so sorry, Emma. Thank you, he said. I assured him we'd come out all right. It's all in the past. But was it really? Is our past ever really in the past? Or does the past sink into our bones? and become a permanent part of us, insistent to determine who we can be. These painful memories shaping our decisions, choosing our directions, dictating our trust and controlling our expressions of love, navigating our lives through loss and anger, leaving us with a nagging question of whether we will ever be enough, ever be all right, and if we can ever forgive. Thank you. Good questions. Good questions. Thank you, Kimberly. Nice work. Our next reader is Annalisa Kamola. She is a writer and developmental editor living in Bellingham, Washington. She works as a coach and the operations manager for the Narrative Project. I can do nothing without her. She has been published in True Stories, the Narrative Project, volumes one, two, and three, and now four. She's working on a coming of age memoir this excerpt is from a piece she calls Ave Maria. Ani? Thanks, Cami. This is not from my memoir, but a different piece. <clears throat> this is a fictionalized account of a single paragraph from my grandfather's autobiography. His name was Teofil Otto Kamala. The cold of New Year's Eve 1943 clung to the bones of the Dachau concentration camp prisoners. In his bunk, crammed between his sleeping neighbors, Teofil tugged his thin wool blanket close around his shoulders. 
He pressed his fists together in front of his mouth and exhaled, hoping to catch some heat. Stars punctuated the sky above. Schutzstaffel guards and towers around the snow-covered camp shuffled back and forth in long wool coats, talking quietly with their guard mates and keeping their eyes on the barracks. Commandant Weiter's orders had been clear. Shoot any prisoner who steps outside. Two Schutzstaffel guards on watch in the middle left tower poured schnapps from a flask into little tin cups. They clinked their drinks and ushered in the new year, hopefully a deliverance from the Slavic rats below. The guards wanted to be home, tucking their children into bed, then screwing their wives. Instead, they drank. Beneath their conversation rose the notes of a violin, sliding first down and then up. Still holding his schnapps, the older guard turned and scanned the camp. Next to him, the younger guard abruptly set his drink on the railing and, in almost the same motion, placed his hands into position on the machine gun. A prisoner stepped from barracks 16 below and to their right. He pushed and pulled the bow across the instrument's strings and walked to the center of the camp road. The young guard pivoted the machine gun and placed the musician in his sights. He adjusted his finger on the trigger, but the rich melody distracted him. His finger hovered. The guard noticed how the stars lit the violinist's hands. In the camp below, sleeping prisoners woke. They braced themselves against anticipated gunshots. Instead, Schubert's Ave Maria made itself at home inside their bodies, as if the beauty itself restrung their muscles. Tears rose in Theophil's eyes, and he blinked them away. In his office, Commandant Weiter sat at his desk, finishing year-end reports. When the music split into two curling melodies an octave apart, he placed his pen parallel to the paper's edge and turned off the heater. He leaned back into his chair and stared at a crack in the ceiling. For four and a half exquisite minutes, everyone listened to the violinist in the street. As the Polish violinist let the last note go, he looked up at the crystalline stars in the dark sky. He waited for the pop, 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 pop of the machine gun, but nothing came. The camp guards, their fingers steeled on triggers, all waited for another to shoot. Slowly, the violinist dropped his head, lowered his instrument, and walked back towards the barracks, his wooden shoes creaking against the snow. As the door to the barracks pulled open and then shut, Teofil finally let his tears drop. He heard the uneven breathing of his bed neighbors too. No one spoke. In the soul-stirring silence after the music, something larger slipped into reality. For a moment, the violinist had been completely free. Thank you. Good work, chilling, Ani. Thank you. Interesting inspiration for that one too. Our next reader is Erica Goodkind. She's a writer living in Seattle. Her fiction has appeared in Ugly Accent, her nonfiction in The Fanzine, and her poetry in the University of Washington's Capillaries, The Journal of Narrative Medicine. Her comedy writing can be found in The, in the Belladonna. Her fictional story tonight, Strangers in the Plight, is excerpted from a novel in progress. She's currently an English major in the at the University of Washington. Erica? Thank you, Cami. Tonight on Atlas Mountain Fire Tower, Norma Keller scans for something to use for kindling. She's already burned through an old novel left behind by some previous fire lookout attendant. The sun's force upon the landscape has waned since returning from today's long off-duty hike, and Norma's is surprised to still be sweating, to still be to be shivering. On the shelf below one of the tower windows sits a wooden box of matches. The warmth of a wood stove fire begs to comfort Norma, but that by the time she remembers she can burn her job orientation paperwork, the evening wind has whipped up and taken grip of her. She feels too broken to even strike a match. To lie down on her hard cotton mattress and slip into oblivion is suddenly all she wants. Splayed across her bed, duck diving through feverish waves, delirium flutters, 
behind her closed eyelids. She feels like she's resurfacing from the ebb of some alien relative to sleep. These resurfacings feel no longer than the beat of a butterfly's wings. Yet within each beat is everything, everything ephemeral, everything constant. Weeks earlier during orientation, three mountain medics spent hours talking about how not to die in the wilderness. Had she even been listening? Was there something about an airborne disease, about mouse droppings? After she'd noticed the critter shit scattered everywhere like confetti on her first day, she'd tied a bandana around her face and sprayed everything with bleach. But just before that, she'd been sweeping up mounds of shattered glass from bullet shot windows, a vandal's welcome. Atlas fire tower, a small window wrapped room perched in the sky atop thick timber legs with no running water, no electricity, and no people. It wasn't just a refuge for Norma's tangled soul. It was also a sanctuary for vermin. Now, as her body moans anemic, ageless hymns, her mind strains for coherency, but there's only the sound of a timpani drum, thunder. Jolting upright, she reaches for her two-way radio. Spade, her boss, had said they'd fly up a helicopter if she ever felt unsafe. Mouse shit fever probably wasn't what he meant. She hesitates. Anyone with a radio will hear her call to evacuate. There will be commotion. She'll be noticed. Being the center of attention sounds worse than impending death. Norma didn't abandon society to rely upon others, to seek help, to be rescued by government issued red tape offends her pride. In the tendrils of her mind, a clear command issues. You will rescue yourself or you'll die trying. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I wonder what will happen. Thank you, Erica. Really good work. Great. Our next reader is Noelle Davenport. Noelle is always on the lookout for her next adventure. The experience of being alone in Africa with no place to live, no friends, and no job was a catalyst to this, ad this adventure in writing. She also blogs, does improv, and proudly wears the moniker Duchess of Squirrel. Reading from her piece tonight, Noelle. Thank you, Kiami. Soon I would be back in Africa, this time in Kenya. I had hoped at 49 that traveling solo to South Africa earlier in the year would finally transform me into the woman I longed to be. The woman who coasted above harsh judgments of others. The woman who knew her place in the world and trusted her own voice. But that woman remained one step ahead of me. And so I was off to try again in Kenya, searching in earnest for her. I had accepted a job with a Kenyan woman named Bakita, an acquaintance from Seattle. She was unapologetically, why am I still seeing you, Cami? <laughs> I don't know, but we can see you. Oh, okay. <laughs> Um, she was unapologetically shipping her 12-year-old daughter, Jessie, to Kenya for boarding school. I was to be Jessie's guardian in school matters and emergencies, and her caregiver during school breaks. I would live in the house Bakita had recently purchased, and other than those school breaks spent with Jessie, my time would be my own. The three of us would fly over to Nairobi together, travel expenses not paid, and get Jesse settled in at school. Then Bakita would go back to the States and I would be free to travel, to write, and above all, to continue my all-consuming crusade to find her, this better version of me that must be out there. August 10th, 2018, departure day at SeaTac sea Airport. Seated opposite my two traveling companions, I slowly drew in a deep cleansing breath and took in the craziness of the departure gate. It was bursting with pale Washingtonians, 
dressed in optimistically bright colors, eagerly waiting their flights to sunnier destinations. Children were running around, bounding off the walls, angry cart drivers beep beeping their way through the crowds of people. There was noise everywhere. Owen Alexander Jones, I swear to God, get down off that nice man's suitcase right now or so help me. Okay, I had nerves of my own to deal with and now I was teetering on the verge of overstimulation. When a, when a greasy cloud of airport fried chicken crept over from the seat behind me, threatening to smother me, I said, stop. It's all too much. I turned to look for refuge in a quiet corner when everything and everyone around me stopped. There was no sound. The hairs on the back of my neck were up so fast it felt like they had been ripped up. A dark foreboding feeling churned once around my gut then slithered up my throat, landing with a lurch on my thick tongue. And then just like that, the switch flipped again. The pinball machine of people was back in action. The cacophony of sounds returned. Dazed, I looked up and saw Bakita's black eyes staring back at me, through me. Something was wrong, I heard myself saying, terribly wrong. There was the voice I was seeking, right there in my head in my gut, telling me something wasn't right. Something bad was going to happen, but I didn't trust it. I ignored it and willed those hairs on my neck to lie back down as I boarded the flight to Kenya. It did not end well. Thank you. No, it did not. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Noelle, nice work. Nice work. Our next reader, Melanie Cool. Happiness expert Melanie Cool looked in the mirror at age 50 and hated the sad face looking back. She decided to change her life despite the obstacles that she faced. Her forthcoming memoir, Hot as Fuck, demonstrates how she spent four years going from surviving to thriving. Happy 50th birthday to me is an excerpt from that memoir. Melanie. Thank you, Cammie. I opened my eyes and thought, yay, today's my 50th birthday. I was a month into my CrossFit journey, pumping iron and whipping my body into shape daily, witnessing my fat diminishing and muscles growing, feeling more positive about my life in general. Then I looked at my nightstand, nothing. I got out of bed, hopeful and excited all the same and dashed towards the kitchen. I was sure I'd see something festive on the counter, a card, flowers, a gift, something, nothing. I checked my phone, no voicemail, no text message, nothing. Even though my husband and I were having problems, I was sure he would acknowledge my 50th birthday. I felt a lump of sadness stuck in the base of my throat, making it hard to swallow. I thought about texting him. I knew there was no point. He wouldn't understand my feelings. In addition, he would shut me down and tell me I'm crazy. After he arrived home later that night, he climbed into bed next to me, dumbfounded by the day. I took a breath of courage and I said, did you know today was my 50th birthday? Of course. Tears started streaming down my face. I couldn't hold them in any longer. This was my big day and he'd ignored it. He'd acted like I was invisible. You're a diva, he retorted, then rolled over to speak at me through the wall. You expect too much? I'm sick and tired of your expectations. I swiped at my tears, 
I was sick of his insults and letting him make me feel like garbage. I knew from experience, no matter how much I tried, there would be no resolution. Then in one fluid motion, I tore the covers off my body and jumped out of bed. As my feet hit the floor, I felt fierce all of a sudden and determined. I stood strong and tall, letting the anger course through me. I let him have it. Get the fuck out of my bed, get the fuck out of my room and get the fuck out of my house, I screamed. No, he said defiantly. My heart kept pounding, telling my body to act. I knew I had to get rid of him. I knew I could not keep moving forward in my life until he was gone for good. But what do you do when you tell a big bully to get out of your house and he won't go? I was pissed enough to imagine myself push pressing a CrossFit move that in this case would involve me thrusting my husband up over my head like a bar with weights on each end and hurling him out the front door. What was I going to do? Thank you. Melanie Cool, fierce and powerful. I can feel that in my bones. Thank you, darling. Nice work. Our next reader is Al Clover. <clears throat> At the age of six, Al Clover stood in front of the grocery store spin rack and a mad magazine with the iconic what me worry cover enticed him to spend his weekly allowance. Somehow that led him to writing his first draft of a novel, The Comic Book Detective. That's his story and he's sticking to it. Tonight he reads from his chapter entitled Road Trip. Al? There are 8 million stories in the rainy city I inhabit. This is one of those stories and it happens to be mine. My name is Alex Carter. Naomi Price had walked into my life on a slow weekday afternoon looking for help. Her uncle had owned a massive assortment of comic books, over 150,000 to be precise, before he passed away and left them to her. Naomi had come to my store, the Comics Clubhouse in Seattle's University District with questions about the value of her uncle's collection. I found myself hijacked not only by her long blonde hair and her easy smile, but also by her uncle's comic collection. In our initial interview, Naomi revealed her uncle had once uh, shown her an Action Comics number one. If it were in mint condition, it could be worth more than a million dollars. The problem was this million dollar find appeared to be missing. I decided to take a road trip visiting some of the other stores to show off the collection. Along with Naomi's boyfriend, Richard, they would join me and my friend Jimmy on this trip. I didn't know this trip would lead me to become more deeply involved in something that had dark undertones. Wong, the owner of Wong's Chinese Food Emporium, stood outside his front door next to my store smoking his morning cigarette. Wong, you know those things are gonna kill you. Wong blew a smoke ring into the air above his head. Ha, Alex, you're a funny guy. My grandfather smoked into his 90s and died a peaceful death in bed with his mistress. Wong smiled, dropped the butt to the sidewalk, then grounded out under the toe of his shoe. Can we expect you for lunch? No, I'm driving to Tacoma with Jimmy and some others. Wong smirked. My grandchildren's college fund will suffer, but you enjoy your inferior lunch. And with that last shot, Wong went back inside. My stomach growled at the smell of the Chinese food filled air. With my insides grumbling, I continued my morning trek on the U District's sunny sidewalks. I was inside the comic clubhouse when Naomi and Richard arrived. I saw them hand in hand as they rounded the corner deep in conversation. I tamped down the hint of jealousy that was trying to peek out. Then, as they passed into the shadow of the building, for just a moment, the world turned noir and the couple's demeanor altered. In the dim light, I thought I saw Richard grip Naomi's arm as if preventing her from running away. 
or toward me for help. I blink my eyes the way you do. I can't believe what you're seeing. Had I really seen that? This was going to be an intriguing day. Hope I survived. Thanks. Oh, Al, thank you so much. I love it. I was just noticing Kathy said, happy to spend a few minutes with Alex, Naomi, and Jimmy again. Me too. Wonderful. We have four readers left. Next, we have Nancy Canyon. Nancy Canyon is the author of Saltwater, a book of poetry, and a novel, Celia's Heaven, winner of Chanticleer's Review, Chanticleer Review's Cygnus Award for Paranormal Fiction, easy for me to say. With an MFA in creative writing from Pacific Lutheran University, Nancy coaches for the Narrative Project and teaches for Chequanut Writers. She lives with her husband in Bellingham, Washington. Lonely in Yakima is an excerpt from her forthcoming memoir, Finding Virgil. Nancy. Thanks, Cammie. Lonely in Yakima. I read somewhere that one should learn to be okay with emptiness. The feeling that grips your diaphragm, presses hard against your heart, and makes you want to bolt somewhere anywhere. Once you accept that feeling, it'll go away. But my loneliness isn't going away. Even with a baby asleep in her crib, my loneliness isn't dented one iota. I crawl in next to Jack. He wraps warm arms around me. We are in our little rental house near the first freeway exit entering Yakima. Dust rolls up from the road where we parked the moving truck this morning. Jack interviewed for a golf course superintendent job, checking out the rental before heading back to Spokane. The job and rental worked out perfectly. And now here we are kissing, about to make love, though I'm not really present. I'm imagining ruffians will exit the freeway and squeal tires past our house, shoot out our windows, break in, kill Jack, and rape me. I know this is silly, but I can't shake the terror I feel. All this, plus the additional jumpy fear that the baby will wake and start crying while we're having sex. And now he's done rolling aside and drifting off. I lie there, eyes wide open, listening to the tiny two bedroom creak and the desolate sound of semis passing. My baby craving started when I was 16. The desire pressed on me like a temperature inversion until I told the man dad hired to run his second business where I worked summer break. We laughed while we matched up invoices standing side by side, me a little too close. He never put the moves on me, thank goodness. I told him things I couldn't tell anyone else, especially not dad. Understandably, he was loyal to my father. Soon dad cornered me in the back room by the postage machine, red faced and shouting, how could you Nance? Still, I'd do it again. I talked to someone who listened without yelling. My dad was overly strict and possessive. But most of all, he was always trying to slip a hand beneath my clothing. He demanded this behavior remain secret. And it did until I turned 18 and confided in our minister who said, tell your mother, she needs to know. My dad had a late business meeting that night, the night I sat across from mother at the kitchen table and told her about the touching. I suspected as much, she said. I started to cry. She reached a hand to cover mine. I jerked it away. He's your stepfather, you know. What? She shook her head, cigarette smoke seeping from her nostrils. Don't you remember? He's not your real father. Thank you. Oh, Nancy, very, very compelling. I'm excited <laughs> for your memoir to come out. Thank, Thank you. you. Our next reader, Mary Jo Campbell. Mary Jo 
was, is a pioneer in alternative education in Canada. And she's a retired teacher founder of class 8J, 9J alternative program at Britannia Secondary in Vancouver. The drop-in center she developed at Riley Park in 1970 evolved to become part of Vancouver's present day alternative school system. Her anthology piece adapted from her memoir in progress called Portable Z describes her experiences working with the Riley Park gang. It's called The Mod Squad Resides at Riley Park. Mary Jo. Hi, <laughs> am I on? Yep, you're okay. on. Um, hi everybody. My inspiration began one afternoon um, in a movie theater in 1967. What I saw on the screen that day I was about to bring to life. The movie was To Sir With Love. The funny thing about intentions is they often guide you to exactly where you want to be. And where I wound up was at the door of my destiny three years later. I was applying for the first youth worker job in Vancouver and the blowback was swift. Why the fuck are you applying for this job anyway, Doug asked. I just graduated with my teaching degree, I replied, tugging self-consciously at my shirt. And there aren't any teaching positions at the moment. Well, this isn't a teaching job, young lady. He wagged his finger at me. You're going to need a whole other set of skills for this position. His chauvinistic response riled me. I know that, I replied. But teaching is more than just classroom lessons, and I can do this. I know these kids. I mean, I know they're vulnerable, lost kids. Leaning forward and slapping his hand on the desk, he yelled back, they're delinquents, Mary Jo. Bad kids with juvenile records. What would you do if one of them pulled a knife? What the fuck do you know about that? I tried to explain to Doug that I'd written a thesis about a school I'd envisioned for inner city kids like these kids at Riley Park but he wasn't listening. He told me to show up the next day and have an interview with the Riley Park Association. They pushed together four tables into the middle of the room, facing a wall of windows looking out onto the park. They invited me to take a seat, but they told me they were reluctant to hire a woman. Suddenly, the interview, the job interview was loudly, loudly interrupted. A gang of teens gathered just outside the center. I realized right away, these were the kids in question. They began violently banging their fists on the windows, creating such a disturbance that it was impossible to continue the meeting. I leaned forward in my chair and I said, would it be all right if, if I went out and introduced myself? <laughs> the committee reluctantly decided to give me a chance calling it a probationary period, and quickly they ended the meeting. It would take years for these kids to be accepted, but in a few short months, it was made clear how far we'd come. Chess was a metaphor for the Riley Park kids, something they picked up in juvie. I remember that we had tournaments, chess tournaments that lasted for days. And one night, I remember the anxiety I felt the first time the police cruiser pulled up, two cops got out. And as they approached, walking 50 yards across the lawn and up to the center, I worried. Police coming always meant trouble, but not this night. They were avid chess players and they wanted to join in. The police officer took a seat across from one of the kids and he made an aggressive first move, an opening move with his king's pawn. What a sight this was. Your move was all he said. There it was, the Riley Park gang facing off against two uniformed police officers in a chess match. Thank you. Nice. Don't mess with powerhouse Mary Jo. Thank you. <laughs> Love it. Mm -hmm. Great, next. We have 
Jennifer Bendemeyer, who works as an ambulatory care nurse in the Seattle area. You'll find her roaming the coastal beaches, inlets, and wooded trails around the beautiful Pacific Northwest with her dog. A lover of the earth and all of its creatures, her writing evokes the wisdom of our natural world that speaks in the language of healing and belonging. Tonight, she reads from her piece called Kaleluk. Did I say it right? <laughs> no. <laughs> Thanks, Kimmy. That was great. <laughs> Okay. The dog gate in the back of the Subaru was kept in place by a pressure mount system that secured it between the floor of the car and the interior roof. That connection wasn't very strong. But then again, my 14-year-old cattle dog, Jake, had never tested it like this before. As Jake continued to dig and scratch furiously at the cargo mat, the gate eventually wobbled and then dislodged. I glanced into the rear view mirror just in time to see it topple forward onto the rear seat backs and then slide back into the compartment. I heard Jake panting in the back and looked for a place to safely pull over to re-secure the gate. But there was only a narrow shoulder along the forested highway. I was still about 10 miles away from Lake Crescent, the closest place to pull over. The gate was lightweight and shouldn't be causing any problem, yet Jake had now gone from making these awkward attempts to move her around it and climb over the back seat to now nothing, no sound at all. I couldn't see anything in the mirror. Not sure what was going on, my heart started to pound. All I could do was drive as fast as possible. As the east end of the lake came into view, I pulled into the vacant parking lot of a general store they'd shut down for the winter. I got out of the car and peered into the back window. Jake was lying down in the back, looking up at me with a sheepish expression. He'd managed to wedge himself between the loose gate and the seat backs, and the gate was pinning one of his legs, but otherwise he seemed fine. I felt a lump rising in my throat. Why, Jake, never before had he behaved like this, and especially not on a road trip. Gravel crunched under my feet in an otherwise empty parking lot. The pristine beauty of the lake seemed surreal. I opened the hatch and Jake jumped out, shaking his whole body and looking up at me. I slipped on the leash and we walked toward the edge of the lake. I needed to clear my head before we continued any, any further. Lake Crescent glows softly in the lingering light. Mountain peaks encircling the lake cast, cast much of it in shadow this time of year. Branches of yellow maple leaves hung low over the water, a vibrant splash of color against the darker old growth conifers. The lake's deep blue shade was exquisite like a gemstone. Jake took advantage of the long leash to weave in and out of trees, sniffing the ground beneath him and I felt my mind settle into the beauty of the moment. While I stood on that shore of the dazzling lake, what I didn't know about Jake that was that this behavior he'd shown on this trip was just the beginning. In the coming weeks at home, he would start acting restless and strange during otherwise quiet evenings and in the middle of dreamless nights. After rushing him to the vet a couple times, I would told he, be told he was suffering from cognitive decline or possibly a brain tumor. But on that day, I just figured we'd been through an incredibly stressful trip and I was glad he seemed to be okay. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Good work. Our final reader, we're gonna go out with a bang here, is Francie Allen. As a youngster, Francie Allen wrote and read voraciously, but she also loved making things. When a college drawing assignment evoked in her a peak experience, Francie turned to art. To better learn visual thinking, she vowed to quit creating with words. Then after 50 years of sculpting, Francie returned with a passion to writing because now she has something to say. Tonight she reads from La Rue Monsieur le Prince. Francie? This is a story uh, about my first sexual awakening. 
I was aboard the Air France jetliner on a red eye headed for Paris, too excited to sleep. It was September 1965. I was 20 and about to begin my junior year abroad program sponsored by Smith College. I'd been studying art and I was eager to get to Paris. Having visited the city once before, I thought I knew what I was getting into. Little did I suspect how Paris would mold me as a woman, a radiantly sexual being, and how very long it would take for me to learn what that meant. Mesdames et messieurs, came a voice from the plane's loudspeaker. We will be landing at l'aéroport de Paris Orly in 45 minutes. Exhausted but excited, I prepared myself to meet Paris, the fantasy place of my dreams, where I hoped to lose my old self, my timidity and fearfulness. And sure enough, almost from the moment I left the plane, the city drew me into its arms. I never tired of watching the svelte French women everywhere with their breathtaking fashions. It was already October and I needed boots for the winter. I planned to buy something chic and French. I began perusing the shoe store windows, but all the shoes were so tiny. Finally, I summoned the courage to enter a store to find my desired purchase. Feeling tentative, I carefully sat on one side of the two rows of back-to-back -back chairs. The saleswoman measured my feet. Mais, mademoiselle, she exclaimed with a slight tone of annoyance, we don't have any boots large enough for your feet. I sat there feeling awkward and disconcerted as the woman went to look for something that might fit. Excusez-moi, mademoiselle, came a deep, soft voice from the chair directly behind me. But are you Danish by any chance? I turned to behold a handsome black man who must have been trying on shoes himself. In French, he continued, I'm asking because I've just returned from a trip to Copenhagen. I love the Danish women. They are so strong and intelligent, so beautiful and big. They have large feet like you. So I'm thinking you must be Danish. Uh, <clears throat> uh, no, I stammered, overcome by the man's beauty, suave yet fresh and raw. His dark brown skin seemed to glow with a richness I found exotic. His eyes caressed me with their tenderness and curiosity. Finally, I found my voice. <clears throat> Je suis américaine. Americans have big feet too, I guess. Oh, I didn't know that, he exclaimed. I have never really seen an American up close. Well, here I am, I replied. I must be your first one. He slowly gave me a wry little smile as he carefully regarded me. Why, yes. You are my first one. He was obviously enjoying the way the conversation was going. And under his gaze, I immediately flushed hot. Oh no, I groaned to myself. Why, oh why was I born a freckle-faced, sweaty palm, blushing redhead? I'm sure he's noticed. Thank you. Nice. Can't wait to see where it goes. Uh, let's see, Claire, you asked if you would put this back in um, gallery view. I think that would be great. I just wanna thank everybody for reading tonight. Francie holding down the anchor with a little ooh la la. And everyone did an amazing job. And thank you all who have stayed and, and applauded and given accolades in the, uh, in the comments because, you know, it's a big deal. So our, our writers are here. We're launching this book and um, some have had some nerves. And so really just ha having you all here holding space with us is really beautiful and wonderful. So thank you so much everybody. And um, I know you would probably love to congratulate 
our um, our writers. So in in a moment, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna offer an opportunity to do that. I think Claire may have something that she wants to say before we do that. And I also want to remind our writers that we have an after party. So go get a drink and come back to the link that was sent out to you by Ani. Claire, do you have anything um, that you want to say before we sign off? Um, I just want to say thank you to everybody. Thanks to all the people who who showed up tonight, and um, thank you to the readers. That was uh, I was captivated the entire time. Um, and of course, I did and will again put the link in the chat so that folks can purchase this book here or any of the True Stories volumes one, two, three, or four. If you follow that link, um, to anyone who ordered a book to be shipped. The remaining, I think the last four copies, uh, the last four orders to be shipped will be shipped out tomorrow. To anyone who ordered a book to be picked up at the bookstore, your book will be ready to be picked up tomorrow by 11 a.m. Um, and I think that that, I think that's all that I need to say. Well done, everybody. Thank you, Claire. I just want to let everybody um, go ahead and unmute yourselves and give a big cheer for our writers and um, so we can hear your voices as well. So feel free to unmute yourself and give a woohoo. Yeah. All right. Everyone. Thank you, Claire. Thank you. And this, this of course, was recorded. It will be on our uh, YouTube channel at Village Books. Okay. Right. Is that Thank it? You, We're done. Great to see you. Good okay. Good night, everybody. Good night. Celebrate. Yeah. <laughs>